basic parameters and that you will also see that designing with inclined screws is basically pretty straightforward once you know how. So to begin with some theory, in webinar session number one, we covered the uh, idea of the laterally loaded screw. And I'll just uh, begin with that here. These types of connections are characterized by dowel effects, which means that we consider the dowel bearing resistance of the wood or in, and also the uh, bending resistance of the fastener. If we use a fully threaded screw, which can take up load in the axial direction like so, if we incline the screw towards the line of the force, then uh, the more and more we incline the screw, the less and less it will be characterized by uh, dowel effects, and the more and more it will be characterized by axial effects. So this means that we now have to consider the withdrawal resistance of the screw anchored into the wood, and also the tensile resistance of the screw itself. The idea of using inclined axially loaded screws uh, primarily came about in the early 2000s, thanks to the development of fully threaded self-tapping screws. These types of screws are optimized for axial loading, and I'm going to elaborate on that with these two slides here. So first of all, you can notice that the thread wings for self-tapping screws are fairly wide. Uh, this gives them very good anchorage into the wood, uh, producing very high withdrawal resistances. Because they're self-tapping, you'll also notice that there's very good mechanical interaction with the surrounding wood and the screw itself, so we're less reliant on uh, proper workmanship and fabrication tolerances uh, in our connections. As far as the material strength goes, uh, self-tapping screws are made from a low alloy carbon steel, which is heat treated. Because it's heat treated, we can achieve very high tensile strengths with our screws. If we compare these to a typical uh, A307 grade lag screw, uh, which has a minimum tensile strength of 60,000 pounds uh, per square inch, then we can achieve approximately double this uh, in many cases with our self-tapping screws. In terms of behavior, a typical load displacement chart for inclined screws may look something like this. If you compare it to a typical load displacement chart for a laterally loaded screw, you can see that there are significant differences in uh, behavior. And I'll go over a few of those differences now. First of all, uh, you notice that the stiffness is much higher for the inclined screws. Generally, you can expect to achieve about 10 to 15 times the stiffness using inclined screws. You'll also notice that the uh, peak resistance for inclined screws comes at very low displacements, typically on the order of a tenth of an inch or two to four millimeters. On the other hand, for a laterally loaded screw, these often reach their peak resistance only after considerable displacement has taken place in the joint. Finally, if we consider ductility to be the ability to resist load without significant reduction in capacity over large deformations, then you can see that laterally loaded screws have the uh, appreciated capacity for ductility while inclined screws have the advantage when it comes to strength and stiffness. As you can see, inclined screws can be applied to a variety of connection types, especially when we're building with mass timber where we often require high capacity connections. You can use these for a variety of wood to wood applications here shown on the left, steel to wood applications shown in the center, and also for a variety of applications where high shear stiffness is required, such as timber concrete composite uh, systems, and also for boosting the shear capacity in CLT in the crossing layers as shown on the lower right-hand corner. In terms of design, I'm again going to start out with the idea of the laterally loaded fastener. These are designed according to the European yield model or the yield limit equations in the NDS. If we resolve these dowel effects into a resultant force, we have a single force acting along the line of the joint as shown here. For inclined screws, there's been a number of design proposals uh, over the years. Uh, for this webinar, I'm going to focus on the uh, design model that's by far the easiest to use and also the easiest to adapt to different building codes. And that is the simplified truss model. So resolved into a system of forces at the shear plane, we have something that looks like this. You'll notice that there are some boundary conditions in terms of the angles. And I'm going to explain what these uh, boundary conditions mean at the end. Uh, for now, I'll just define what these angles are. So for beta, we're defining that as the angle between the screw axis and the line of the force. And alpha is the angle between the screw axis and the direction of the wood grain. The idea of the uh, truss model is that at certain angles, these connections are characterized uh, predominantly by axial effects. And so the design model is based on the axial resistance of the screw shown here in red. When we load these connections, we activate a normal force and the shear plane. 
And because we have a normal force in the shear plane, this means that we can also account for friction in our design model. A lot of people, when they're presented with the uh, simplified trust model, uh, ask questions about dowel effects and whether or not they need to be considered. And I think it's worth clarifying that the simplified trust model uh, doesn't deny the existence of dowel effects when these connections are loaded. Uh, the idea, rather, is that uh, the engineer can safely neglect these uh, effects for the sake of practicality. And this is something that I'll investigate a little further in the follow-up webinar uh, next week. So it could have been a very complicated uh, system to model. It's now made into something very simple and easy to manage. Uh, we have a system of forces here. Our lateral resistance is considered to be the sum of the axial component in the shear plane and the friction force. And down below, I have the conceptual model of the design equations that we use to design these types of joints. So I'll go over how this uh, uh, system of forces relates to the uh, conceptual model below. First of all, the axial force, we take this to be the minimum of the withdrawal resistance in the main member or the side member, or the tensile strength of the screw. The axial component is simply the cosine component of the axial force. The normal force is simply the sine component of the axial force. And the friction force is the normal force multiplied by a coefficient of friction. Generally, we assume this to be 0 0.25 for uh, steel to wood and wood to wood connections. It's a nice conservative uh, estimate. And there's also this an effective coefficient at the beginning of the design equations. And this is here to account for uneven load sharing in multiple fastener connections. We take this to be 0 0.9 times n, n being the total number of fasteners acting together in the connection. One more thing to mention before we go into design examples. Since the screws are generally installed at an angle to the grain, we need to use a withdrawal parameter that's based on the angle alpha, which is the angle between the screw axis and the direction of the wood grain. These values can be found in our structural screw design guides uh, for Canada and the US, which can be downloaded from our uh, website. So on to a few design examples. Uh, I'm going to keep things at a conceptual level for the most part in this webinar. Uh, for this first specimen, we have Douglas fir main and side members, so it's a wood-to-wood -wood connection. You'll also notice that when we look at the side view, we have four screws uh, per shear plane, so we have eight screws in total for this H-block specimen. Looking at the thread penetration lengths, you'll see that these are measured uh, along the length of the axis. We have 2.5 inches in the side member and 7.5 inches of thread penetration length in the main member. We can also express these lengths as a function of the diameter size D. So using a 5 16th of an inch screw, which is eight millimeters, this would be 8D in the side member and 24D in the main member. In our design procedure, we consider three possible failure modes that can characterize the ultimate capacity of these connections. So we'll consider the withdrawal resistance of the side members uh, with the withdrawal resistance of the uh, screws in the main member and the tensile strength of the screws in the shear plane. In this case, since we have fairly low anchorage in the side member, we expect to see that the withdrawal resistance in the side members uh, will govern the connection capacity. And when we load this specimen to failure, this is just what we see. You notice in this picture on the left that the screws have been pulled into the side member, indicating a withdrawal failure. And when we open up the shear plane to have a look at the uh, wood failure, you'll see that there's very little wood crushing here, uh, indicating that these uh, connections are primarily loaded uh, axially along the screw. Looking at this low displacement chart for this specimen, uh, we uh, reached a peak resistance of nearly 28,000 pounds at a displacement of 0 0.09 inches or 0, uh, 126 kilonewtons at 2.4 millimeters. The thing to notice with this low displacement chart is that once the screws begin to fail and withdraw here, we still have some uh, residual load carrying capacity um, as the screws are still intact in our specimen. So we assume that the load is taken up in friction along the axis of the screw, uh, but primarily in uh, inclined dowel action since the screws are still intact. For this next test specimen, this is similar to the previous one, although you've noticed that now we've increased the thickness of the side members. So now we have uh, thicker side members and uh, therefore we've also increased the length of the screws in our side members as well. So now we have uh, 20D thread penetration length in the side member uh, as opposed to 8D in the previous uh, test specimen and very high thread penetration length in the main member, 25D in this case. Again, we will consider the uh, 
possible governing capacities in our design procedure, including the withdrawal resistance of the screws in the side members, the withdrawal resistance of the screws in the main member, and the tensile strength of the screws at the shear plane. In this case, since we have uh, high thread penetration lengths in both the main and the side members, uh, the screws are so firmly anchored into the wood that they will fail in tension before ever being pulled out of the uh, wood in withdrawal. And when we look at the load displacement chart for this specimen, we see that the initial range of behavior is very similar to the previous test specimen. Now this is indicated in black. Uh, we reach a peak resistance of 36,000 pounds at 0 0.09 inches. So we have higher stiffness and higher uh, peak resistance due to the increased thread penetration lengths. Although you'll notice that we have no residual uh, load carrying capacity far beyond the uh, peak resistance. In this case, when the screws fail in tension, there's no uh, residual load carrying capacity because the screws are no longer intact. So far, I've been talking about screws loaded in one direction only, uh, such that the screws are loaded primarily in tension, as shown here. We can call these shear tension screws to distinguish them from screws loaded in the opposite direction, uh, like so. Uh, we can call these screws shear compression screws just to differentiate them. When shear compression screws are loaded uh, in the manner illustrated here, it's important to note that we do not see connection behavior that's characterized by axial effects. Uh, rather, what we see is uh, low stiffness, lots of screw bending, and even element separation uh, shown in this slide. As it turns out, we don't really see an increase in stiffness until we incline the screw towards the line of the force. Uh, which you can see on this uh, half of the chart. And what you'll also notice is that the lower we incline the screw towards the line of the force, uh, the more stiffness we achieve in our connection. What's interesting though is that if we combine a shear tension screw with a shear compression screw, uh, creating a symmetrical screw cross, then the behavior of both screws will be characterized by axial effects. Furthermore, if uh, we're using symmetrical screw crosses, we create connections that have uh, equal performance in both loading directions. Uh, when this makes them especially suitable for uh, connections where we need uh, capacity for uh, reverse loading. For symmetrical screw crosses, the truss model can again be applied here. Just as before, we'll consider the axial resistance of the shear tension screw shown here in red. Now we'll also consider the axial resistance of the shear compression screw, which is loaded primarily in compression along the axis, as shown here. And finally, when we look at the normal force generated from the shear tension screw, which is on the left, we'll notice that it's opposed by a force acting in the opposite direction from the shear compression screw. Because these forces cancel out, this means that we can no longer account for friction in our design model. In the study that's uh, cited here in the lower right-hand corner, the author loaded these two specimens here to failure, and the only difference between the two of them is that for the upper specimen, all the screws in the specimen were exclusively shear tension screws, while in the lower specimen, the uh, screws were arranged in symmetrical screw crosses. When these uh, specimens were loaded to failure, it was noticed that there was about a 25% decrease in capacity for the specimen with the uh, symmetrical screw crosses. And the author of this study attributed these, uh, this reduction in capacity to the absence of friction in the specimen. So working with the truss model again, we have a relatively simple system of forces to work with. Our lateral resistance is considered to be the sum of the axial force components in the shear plane. For the shear tension screw, we consider the axial resistance as before, being the minimum of the withdrawal resistance and the tensile strength. For the shear compression screw, uh, we consider the withdrawal resistance to be the same whether we're pushing or pulling on the screw. So the withdrawal resistance is the same as the uh, shear tension screw. Uh, for the material strength though, uh, the same author of this previous study uh, proposed that a 0.8 reduction factor be used to estimate the uh, material strength of the shear compression screw uh, when it's loaded in compression. So we can look at a final design example here with a symmetrical screw cross uh, test specimen. This one has CLT side members as well. This one has 16 screws arranged in eight symmetrical screw crosses. We have uh, relatively high thread penetration length, minimum being 17D in the side member. And when we load this specimen to failure, we have a load displacement chart that looks like this. This one is indicated in black here. 
you'll see that we have an increase in stiffness and approximately double the capacity compared to our previous specimens with eight screws of a similar size. So this supports the case that these screws are loaded primarily axially. You'll also notice that there's a steep drop in capacity here and here uh, with some residual load carrying capacity as well beyond the peak. Uh, what we notice with symmetrical screw crosses is that um, when we have sufficient thread penetration lengths in both members, any sudden drop in capacity will typically be from the uh, tension failure of these shear tension screws, while inclined uh, shear compression screws can pick up some load uh, through inclined dowel action and bending backwards. I'm going to start wrapping things up. Uh, we have a few boundary conditions to review that are important to keep in mind when we design inclined screw connections. First of all, the angle beta between the screw axis and the line of the force. There's a lower bound here of 30 degrees. Uh, generally, we don't want to go below 30 degrees because it becomes very difficult to install screws at any angles lower than this when we're using handheld power tools. For the upper bound of 45 degrees, it's worth mentioning that there are some standards out there that specify a maximum of 60 degrees, uh, especially uh, design standards found in Finland. Uh, for confirmation testing in North America, we've done almost all of our testing within this range here, so we like to stick to this range for now. Um, it's important to note as well that uh, for the majority of cases, almost all of uh, uh, inclined screw connections will be performed using 45 degree installation angles because this balances ease of installation, uh, high shear stiffness, and also high strength. As for alpha, you don't want to go below 30 degrees because we don't want our connections to be characterized by end grain effects, especially since these are typically designed to be high capacity connections. Generally, we'll be loading these uh, specimens and connections uh, parallel to the grain in the wood. This makes sense when you think about it. If we're designing a high capacity connection, we want the wood to be loaded in a high strength loading direction as well. The other thing to mention is that we uh, have done so much testing in this loading direction that we understand the failure modes of the wood in this loading direction fairly well. So you want to be cautious about deviating from this condition uh, in your connections. Uh, one notable example would be CLT. Uh, we've done a lot of testing in CLT and uh, this seems to be fine as long as your uh, uh, screws are anchored into sufficient layers loaded parallel to the grain. The truss model has been proposed for shearing joints, not for pulling joints, which is what I'm illustrating here. So until more research has been conducted on pulling joints with inclined screws, we should not assume that design model can be uh, carried over um, to uh, pulling joints. As far as geometry requirements are concerned, the end and edge distances for the screws are measured from the center of gravity of the threaded portion of the screw in either the main member or the side member. And the spacing between the screws is measured uh, perpendicular to the axis as shown here. Stiffness in these connections is a function of both the thread penetration length and the angle of installation. So for all of the screws that are working together in the connection, they should be installed at the same uh, thread penetration lengths in both members. For shear tension screws, uh, they should be arranged in uh, a mutually parallel arrangement. And for symmetrical screw crosses, the angles should be equal and opposite one another. When checking the tension strength of the timber we're using, we should consider the net section to be the gross cross-sectional area minus the projected area of the screws from the outer thread diameter as indicated in red here. And next, if we're designing highly stressed symmetrical connections, meaning it's loaded from both sides, say for a hold down application, we should consider the fact that inclined screws can introduce a tension force uh, perpendicular to the grain as indicated on the right. In order to prevent wood failure due to this loading condition, we simply reinforce the connection from either side, and we can do this by overlapping the screws, a minimum distance of 4D as shown here. Finally, the use of steel plates introduces the likelihood of pre-tensioning in the screws. If we're using steel plates, we should also specify that power tools with torque clutches be used for installation. By using a torque clutch, even load uh, sharing and multiple, uh, multiple fastener connections is promoted uh, through even pre-tensioning of the screws. One final word on design, we have to be sure to use design values that are calibrated to the building code that we're working with. So we have our ICC report for design values in, in the uh, United States and our CCMC report for design values in Canada. These design values are also published in our Structural Screw Design Guide, which you can download for free on our website.
For designers in the US, we've recently released the CLT Connections Design Guide. For anyone attending this webinar today, you're gonna to get a 15% discount code, uh, which will be uh, included in the follow-up email that Matt will be sending out shortly. So be sure to check out the follow-up webinar next week in which I'll be reviewing some other design models and assessing their suitability against some of our uh, recent test data. And in this one, I'll be going a little bit more into some of the uh, number crunching involved in these connections. So this concludes the basic theory and behavior of Incline Screws webinar. I'd like to thank you once again for joining today. I'm going to stick around online for a few minutes and I'll have a look at some of these uh, questions that have come in and I'll do my best to answer a few of them. I'll also mention that if anyone is interested in doing further reading, I've assembled a reading list, uh, which you will see on the last slide, which you can have a look at when you download the PDF of this PowerPoint presentation. So there's a good question here. Can I apply short-term loading factors if I am close to reaching the tensile capacity of an inclined fastener? This is an important point to mention. The uh, short-term duration factor um, is 1.6 when we're using the NDS and 1.15 when we're using CSA 086. So when we're checking our minimum capacities for the axial force of the screw, if we're using short-term loading, we have to apply the short-term loading factor only to um, the withdrawal because this is a uh, wood property and not a steel property. There's another question here. Can you provide the calculations utilized for the design examples uh, for US standards, such as equations used, assumptions made, etc.? Um, a good place to look for this type of information is our uh, CLT design guide. We do have a few design examples in here. Um, keep an eye out on our knowledge base section of our website because I'll be publishing a blog post uh, with uh, formal equations uh, published. Um, I think these are the best places to look for now. Also stay tuned for the next webinar. We'll, uh, we'll be doing a little bit more uh, number crunching as I mentioned at the end. There's a great question here. What is the design approach used for inclined screws to reinforce for rolling shear? So um, in CLT, the crossing layers typically have a low shear strength uh, because it's governed by rolling shear. Uh, this is a good question. It's uh, too long for me to answer uh, in this webinar, but uh, perhaps this is something that um, you can look into. I did mention uh, a paper that's included in the resource section of our PDF. So uh, I'll make a point of pointing that out in the follow-up uh, webinar. The other thing you can do is when you look in that slide, the study that's cited on that slide will direct you towards that paper. This is a really good question too. Is the ideal angle 45 degrees or is it closer to 30 degrees? Uh, 45 degrees is typically what we use because uh, as I mentioned, it balances uh, ease of installation, uh, high shear stiffness and high strength. 30 degrees um, is not used as often because the installation is a little bit more difficult. Um, however, you do have a much uh, higher increase in capacity and stiffness. You may have to use much longer screws to um, uh, achieve the right anchorage into the wood, um, but you'll typically see this favored in uh, composite uh, action. So timber concrete composites may uh, look at this application, uh, but it can also be used for wood to wood applications as well. Uh, I'll do one final question here and then we'll wrap things up. Um, there's lots of really good questions here and uh, we'll be following up with um, uh, answers to all of these questions as best we can in our follow-up uh, email. Now, the final question I'm going to take today is, can you talk a little bit longer about the pre-tensioning of the screws? Um, first of all, the big difference between um, partially threaded screws and fully threaded screws is that if we're doing a wood-to-wood -wood connection, uh, for using a partially threaded screw, the threads typically go into the main member and the uh, uh, 
the resistance uh, from the axial component of the screw comes from the pull-in resistance in the side member. So when we tighten these screws, it uh, basically uh, pulls the member together. So we get pulling action with partially threaded screws. With fully threaded screws, the threads basically lock the wood uh, together in position. So if you have a gap, then um, the wood is basically locked in place with that gap. When we're using steel side plates though, the threads uh, do not engage with the steel side plates. So we have this pulling action like we see with partially threaded screws. Um, and the pre-tensioning thing is something to keep in mind because if we're using a steel side plate and we pre-tension some of the screws more than others, then these might pick up more of the load initially uh, promoting uneven load sharing. So that's just uh, something to keep in mind. Uh, once again, thanks again for joining me today. Uh, it's a pleasure to do these uh, educational uh, events. And uh, with that, I think Max, uh, Matt, if you'd like to close things up, I'll leave it to you. Sure, absolutely. Thank you, thank you, Keith. So thank you everyone for joining us today. So we hope that the webinar, the webinar was both useful and interesting. Uh, so as Keith mentioned a few times, we will be sending out this email tomorrow with the replay, the answers to your questions and the slide deck as well, and the discount code for the handbook. So if you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to contact us at info at mytcon.com. It's on the slide showing right now. So we'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. So thank you very much and hope you have a good day.